Great to meet you. Nice right? to meet you too. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Moses, for that extraordinary introduction. This is a very exciting time to be alive and to be a creator, an artist, an entrepreneur, or a leader in business, government, or civil society, because it turns out that the technology likely to have the greatest impact on the world in the next 20 years has arrived. And it's not the social web, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, self-driving cars, uh, or any of these other uh, inventions, though they're all significant in their own right. It's the technology behind cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and it's called the blockchain. So just before I go on here, just a show of hands, who's heard of the blockchain? Raise your hand, please. Okay, so I'd say about a quarter. It's interesting. I asked the question, um, I've been asking the question for about a year now. I'd say a year, about a year ago, very few people would raise their hand. So for those who haven't heard of it, um, this is a, an important moment because you might recall it 20 years from now as the first time you heard about this technology in the same way that you might recall the first time you heard about the internet in 1992 or 1993. Because we become convinced that this technology represents nothing short of the second generation of the internet. So when you use the internet today to send and move and share information like emails, websites, PDFs, and PowerPoints, you're not actually sending an original, you're sending a copy. And generally speaking, that's a good thing. In fact, it's one of the great things about the internet. We have a publishing platform where we can democratize information and share it with the world. But when it comes to things of value, like money, or stocks, or bonds, sending a copy is a really, really bad idea. If I give you $20 in payment for something, it's really important that you know that you have it, and I don't. And I can't send the same $20 to someone else in this row or to everyone in this entire room. Because if I were able to do that, the $20 um, would become worthless. And the global economy would collapse and I would go to jail. And those are all really bad things. So it's great that we have a, a printing press for information, but it's not so great when you have a printing press for value. And this is actually a vexing problem that cryptographers, which is a form of mathematics, have been trying to solve for 20 years. This idea of how do you create a digital medium for value that enables people to transact online in the same way that they share information online seamlessly and frictionlessly. Well, it turns out we need help. <laughs> this old joke on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, actually kind of turned out to be true when it comes to transactions or business online. Uh, establishing the identity of another party and creating trust actually turned out to be a really, really difficult problem. So as a result, we rely on middlemen, banks, big technology firms, but also governments, to establish identity, create trust, to perform all the transaction logic, like the clearing and the settling, and to keep records that can be independently audited after the fact. And generally speaking, these intermediaries do an okay job, but with some serious limitations. For one, they're all centralized. And anything that's centralized is vulnerable to attacking or hacking uh, or loss of data. Just ask any customer of LinkedIn or Target or JP Morgan or any employee of the State Department or the NSA. They tax the system. In the case of sending money cross-border, it can cost anywhere between 10 and 15% to move money. They capture our data, not only preventing us from monetizing it, but also potentially undermining our privacy uh, during the process. They take a long time to get things done. You know, a lot of the technology behind um, some of the things you might think are seamless, like the financial services industry, are built using mainframe technology that's older than I am. And that's why it can take days or weeks to clear and settle transactions in any variety of assets. In sum, they capture an asymmetric benefit of the value of the first generation of the internet, much as they did, and perhaps even more so than in the pre-digital age. What if? There were a vast, global, distributed platform that was accessible to anyone that ran on millions of computers, where not just information, but literally anything of value, money, stocks, bonds, but also titles and deeds to property, intellectual property, um, even things like votes could be managed, stored, and moved securely and privately, and where trust was not established by a central third party like a bank, 
but rather through mass collaboration and clever code based on some hardcore mathematics. Well, in 2008, the global financial system collapsed. Somewhat propitiously, an anonymous person or group of persons under the name Satoshi Nakamoto created a uh, new protocol for digital cash, money that you could move online peer-to-peer -peer in the same way when you go buy a hot dog, you give the guy $10, $5, however much it costs, um, without having to go through an intermediary. And it worked. And now that platform is worth $10.5 billion. Uh, it's not owned or controlled by anyone, kind of like the internet. It set off a spark, which captured the computing world by storm and has quickly spread to the world of financial services, government, other businesses, creative industries, which we'll talk about, and other areas of business and society. So for the first time in human history, two or more parties can transact, do business, um, enter into contracts, build value online without knowing or trusting each other, and where you don't need an inter intermediary to establish trust, because trust is native to the technology. If the first generation of the internet was the internet of information, the second generation is the internet of value, a new medium for money. So how does this work? Well, it starts with a distributed ledger. It's kind of like a, like a massive global spreadsheet that's running on millions of computers all around the world that everyone can see and access. Transactions happening on this network are validated not by intermediaries, but by a community of participants who each commit computing resources into this network, and for achieving consensus on what is true, they get rewarded. Every so often, transactions on this network are batched into these things called blocks. The blocks are added to a chain of blocks, which is the really critical invention here. Because what it means is that if I wanted to hack a transaction, like say, send the same $20 to someone else, I wouldn't just have to go back and change one number in this, in this ledger. I wouldn't have to go back and hack one transaction. I'd have to hack every single transaction all the way back to the beginning of commerce on the blockchain and do so in broad daylight, fighting against the most powerful computing resource in the world. For example, the Bitcoin blockchain is estimated to be 5 to 20 times as powerful as all of Google's servers put together and do that in a very short period of time. That is functionally, practically impossible. Each of these blocks is then time-stamped, which means that any attempt to alter what has occurred, a transaction, a movement of value, a decision, um, is effectively impossible. So this has implications, of course, for the financial services industry. So who knows what that is there? Just shut it out. It's a Rube Goldberg machine, which is a really complicated apparatus. It does a bunch of things, and in the end, it solves a really simple task. It cracks an egg. This is kind of like how the financial services industry works. <laughs> no, it's true. Like, you go to Starbucks, and you tap your card on the card reader, and you think that that value is moving boop, boop, peer to peer from your card or your account to their account. It's not. It's going through a series of intermediaries, sometimes five or six different intermediaries, your bank, their bank, credit card processor, um, a, uh, a clearinghouse system, running on computers sometimes that are 30, 40 years old. It takes four or five days for that money to land in Starbucks' bank account, but not before everyone's taken their cut. And it turns out that every single part of the financial services industry is going to be disrupted by this. I won't go into it, but it's an entire chapter in our book. Um, you know, it's a complicated business, but really it does a few key things. Enables a way for people to move money, store money, get access to um, uh, capital in the form of growth equity or debt, uh, a way to account for what's occurred in a business to insure against catastrophic risk, um, and other important functions. Each of them will be impacted. And it's no small wonder, given the potential of this technology rooted in, in mathematics, that all of a sudden people are waking up to it. This was a cover story in The Economist. They said blockchain technology is not one of the most important inventions of the last 20 years. It's one of the most important inventions of the last 200 years, along with double-entry bookkeeping and the joint stock corporation. Now, admittedly, those are not the sexiest things in the world, you know. <laughs> joint, double, double-entry book. But, um, but they're kind of important, because without them, we wouldn't have the modern econom economic order and modern culture and society that we know today. 
And given the potential of blockchain, it's no small wonder why a lot of leaders in business and government and other areas are trying to figure out just what the heck all this stuff means. So I see, I see some older faces and I see some younger faces. And uh, that means some of you are Dilbert in this situation and some of you are the boss. Uh, you know who you are. And uh, so the boss walks in, I think we should build a blockchain. What? Oh no, does he know what that means? Or is it something he read in a trade magazine ad? But what color would you like your blockchain? Well, I think mauve has the most RAM. So that doesn't make any sense. Ha, ha, ha. Um, there's a lot of confusion about what this means. Um, and we think it's profound. In the re research for the book, we ended up conducting 10 different projects to try and better understand the implications of blockchain. And Moses pointed out financial services. And certainly financial services will be transformed by this technology, but it's actually only one of, diff of 10 different transformations that we studied. And the one that I want to share with you today, this is one chapter in the book, is on this question of prosperity, which is that the digital revolution brought about by the internet has done a lot of really great things. How we share information, how we communicate. I can now have a high resolution Skype call with a friend on the other side of the world. I can access content. But on some of the really important metrics that matter, namely on prosperity, this idea that we all get ahead, that the rising tide of technology lifts all boats. The internet has a decidedly mixed track record. In fact, the number one policy issue in OECD countries today is this question of income inequality and wealth inequality. The first generation of the internet has done very little for the billions of people in the world who don't participate in the global economy. And for the first time in the modern era, the 51st percentile, the middle class in a lot of parts of the world, is slipping, not moving ahead. What's to be done about this? Well, we think there are seven ways that blockchain can fix some of these problems including billions of people in the global economy. This is low-hanging fruit as far as I'm concerned. Um, of the 7 billion people in the world, 2 billion of them don't have a bank account. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. Sometimes it's because they don't have a balance that's enough to that justify a bank account from the eyes of a bank. But more importantly, it's because they don't have an identity. I was talking at uh, ID2020 at the United Nations three weeks ago. They're trying to bring 2 billion people in the world who don't have a birth certificate, driver's license, passport, anything, a way to prove who they are so that they can access everything from government services to financial services. With blockchain technology, we've got a way to fix that. Identity is a lot easier to establish because everything you do enters into this record that you control. And you can use that as proof of who you are, and that can help you to get a microloan or get access to banking. And this is an important development that will allow billions of people access to the global economy. There's a famous Peruvian economist. His name is Hernando de Soto. And he says, actually, the bigger issue is not financial inclusion, it's this question of land titles, which is that 70% of people in the world who think they own land actually have a really flaky title to it. And this is true in, a lo in, in most of the global south. He says, basically, outside of your bubble in North America, Europe, New Zealand, and Australia, Singapore, and a couple other small places, people don't have access to a uh, clear title. So this actually happened in Honduras. Um, a dictator decided, you know, you may think you own your land, but I'm saying that uh, your friend, my friend owns your land, and I'm going to take it and build beach houses on that property. That led to a bloodless coup, and now the government of Honduras is working with a blockchain company called Factum to develop an immutable record of who owns what that can't be altered by one single source, and you can use as a record of truth to prove who owns property. It's also happening in Georgia, and there are pilot projects in the United States as well. Could we create a true sharing economy? This whole question of Uber and Airbnb, are they sharing economy companies? I'd say no. They're giant corporations that are service aggregators. They aggregate excess capacity, cars, hotel, uh, people's rooms, into a central platform and then resell it. We think with blockchain there's an opportunity to create a true sharing economy because really what they do, other than the coordinating, is they have a native payment system. Uh, they've got a reputation system that allows you to know your Uber driver's reliable. And they've got a way for you to enter into contracts and to bargain, um, or they do the bargaining and the contracting for you. All of those things can be radically simplified through technology using blockchain. $600 billion a year flows from the developed world into the developing world, from diasporas living abroad into their ancestral lands. It's bigger than foreign aid, and it's bigger than direct foreign investments. The largest flow of funds in the developing world. 
According to the World Bank, the average fees are around 10%. And uh, just a brief story, um, a housekeeper in Toronto used to send money with Western Union. She would travel hours out of her way to send that money and uh, fill out paper forms and uh, pay about 10%. The money would take five to seven days. Now, six months ago, she uh, signed up with a company called Abra, which uses the blockchain to make frictionless peer-to-peer -peer payments where she doesn't pay 10%, she pays 0.25%. And where the money doesn't arrive five days later, it arrives five seconds later. That is a significant shift. It's tens of billions of dollars into the hands of some of the poorest people in the world. The virtual you. That's actually the virtual Don, my co-author. And that's his, that's his real body. He's, uh, he, he's a fit guy. Um, <laughs> So the, the biggest asset class that's been created during the first generation of the internet is data. It's like uh, industrial plant in the industrial age or land in the agricultural age. But the funny thing is, is we create it, but we don't own it. Big corporations own it, governments own it, and they know more about you than you do. The virtual you doesn't know whether or not you um, traveled a certain place or bought a certain thing or what you said exactly one year ago, but the virtual you does. Uh, with blockchain, we're able to take that back or we'll be able to create a virtual you, a black box that you control. And you share the small fraction of data that you need to get a service. If you want to pay for something, they don't need to know your identity, not necessarily. If you go buy a hot dog, the guy doesn't ask for your driver's license. Uh, when you want to get access to financial services, you can include all this data to get access to the best rate for your mortgage or something like that. This is one I think that's probably relevant for a lot of people here, which is that the digital age has actually made it worse for artists, and, and Moses alluded to that, where uh, 25 years ago, according to Eddie Schwartz uh, from the Canadian Songwriters Association, if he wrote a hit single, he sold a million copies, he would get paid $45,000 as the songwriter. Even that doesn't seem like a lot relative to a million copies. But today, that same song gets streamed a million times, he can expect to make 36 bucks. Not even enough to get himself to the airport. So could we use blockchain technology to solve this problem? Imogen Heap is a uh, world-renowned singer-songwriter who's built a platform called Mycelia. What Mycelia does is imbue songs with intelligence. So every time a song is listened to, it's not just music. It's got licensing rights and royalty rights built into it. So you listen to a song on the radio, a certain bit stream of money goes directly to the artist. You uh, sample a piece of music that goes into a film, that's a different royalty scheme. You, um, you know, play it in a commercial, you buy a copy, you remix the drum track for a song. Every single time it's a different regime. And that enables artists to get fed first rather than intermediaries. And the final one is Reinventing Government. These are two books that were written in 1992 and 1993. Um, Osborne and Gabler's Reinventing Government and the Gore Report. And I think looking back 24, 25 years later, we have to take a sober reflection. What, what exactly has the internet done to change government? I think in a lot of respects, they've just paved the cow path. They've taken what they did before and they've put it online. It's digital wallpaper. It's not actually changing the underlying mechanics. Uh, we think that blockchain could bring sunlight to bear on a lot of important government processes. You know, sunlight is the best disinfectant and transparency uh, could make government more, work more effectively. But also, it could make it work better, faster, and cheaper. And this, the Canadian Senate actually put out a report last year saying that this is the second generation of the internet and that the government of Canada should put its money where its mouth is and deliver essential services like healthcare, like welfare, and the procurement and collection of taxes using this system. So that is one chapter of this book. There are other chapters that deal with big themes. But what I want to leave you with is this. It appears that, once again, the technology genie has been unleashed from the bottle. Summoned by an unknown person or persons at an uncertain time in history, this genie is once again at our disposal to transform the economic power grid and the old order of human affairs for the better. But technology is not a panacea. Blockchain alone can't solve these problems. People solve problems. And this will require leadership. You might be asking yourself, how can I get involved? What's the next step? Well, I would recommend that you buy Blockchain Revolution in massive volume. <laughs> you look like people with friends. Christmas is, no. Um, 
Personal use is a precondition for better understanding. I'd encourage you to, to take this as a, a first step on a long journey to better understand the second generation of the internet. Uh, because the opportunity here is tremendous, and we need your help. So join the revolution. Thank you. Alex, thank you for that exceptional talk. Thank you. I, I have one, one, I have a book full of questions. Um, but I wanted to ask you, as we go from blockchain concept and information to a thing called Bitcoin, which is always represented as a physical mm -hmm. object, and then we add Ethereum and all these other new currencies that are appearing, how does it finally translate into something with which you can buy a cup of coffee? Well, it's interesting. Um, cryptocurrencies are an incredible development, and they're actually widely used by over 10 million people. And they're actually really interesting if you're in parts of the world where the current uh, currency is collapsing or where there are strict capital controls. But for everyday people like you, you in the audience, I don't foresee you in the near future buying Bitcoin and buying things with Bitcoin. We have a pretty good alternative. It's called the Canadian dollar. What's going to happen probably in 14 to 24 hours is that Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of Canada and now currently the governor of the Bank of England, is going to announce uh, the Bank of England's stance on blockchain and at his Mansion House speech. It's the biggest speech he gives all year. And there are some rumors that he might announce a digital pound. And I think the same will likely happen in Canada, in the US, and in other enlightened countries. Because as a basis for the economy to reduce risk, reduce friction, and create value, this is a significantly better alternative than what we have today. So stay tuned. Yeah. Do you mind? I, I'm going to ask one more. <laughs> I, I still don't quite understand how it ends up in your bank account, if the bank is gone. Yeah. Um, if it, how, how it ends up where you can manipulate it to buy the coffee or a house or a car, does it mean that everybody else has to begin to want to accept bitcoins and ethereums and then we're going to need some way to match a bitcoin to a Canadian dollar and so on? Well, I think that cryptocurrencies as a way to, to make payments is one small fraction of the story that we tell in the book. It's the underlying technology that we think can change the world. Bitcoin and Ethereum, these kinds of things, are accepted today by hundreds of thousands of merchants. Um, but as I said, I feel like most normal people will continue to use the, the dollar that they're accustomed to. On the question of, of banks and, and financial services companies, we're not advocating that banks are going away. In fact, some of the biggest proponents of this technology are some of the world's largest banks. And they see an opportunity to radically reduce cost and risk from their businesses. So it's all very likely that in the near future, you will use your mobile app, uh, wallet application, be it an RBC or some new company, to make payments, to buy music, to stream content, to organize your affairs, to enter into contracts without you really even knowing that blockchain is behind it. But it is this missing piece that we need um, to make the internet work for everyone, I think. OK. Uh, clear. <laughs> Thank you for the